It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hello and welcome to episode 254 of Science on Top. Today is Sunday, the 12th of February, 2017. I'm Ed Brown and I'm joined by Penny Dumsday. Hello. And Lucas Randall. Hey. Before we start, just a quick reminder that we're now on Patreon. It's an easy way for you to show your appreciation and throw a little money our way. You can donate per episode and the more money you pledge, the better the rewards you get. From news and information exclusive to our patrons... Uh, extra episodes, and even your very own personal Science on Top beanie to keep you warm when you're stargazing. So check out scienceontop.com slash donate. We do this as a labour of love, but of course there are plenty of costs involved. And for some reason we haven't received our big brown envelopes from Big Pharma for quite a while, so we need to help. <laughs> it's so disappointing, I promised them. They've let us down, I know. Uh, Evil corporations trying to poison our babies. No, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start off with a look at frog tongues. A lot of people have no doubt watched the video of a frog playing the ant crusher game on a mobile phone. Digital ants crawling down the screen and the frog enthusiastically tries to zap them with its tongue. It's a kind of a cruel video, but it has had more than 10 million views on YouTube. The interesting thing about a frog's tongue is that it is so damn sticky. It is stickier than anything humans have come up with. Penny, has the sticky secret of the frog tongue finally been revealed? I think it might have been. Um... Good, because that was the most Daily <laughs> Mail headline I've ever said. <laughs> the sticky secret of the frog tongue finally revealed. <laughs> So it is a kind of interesting question. Like I think because I'm familiar with seeing frogs do that, mm. it didn't struck me how actually bizarre it is. Imagine shooting something out at a tiny flying, very lightweight insect and instead of just batting it away, actually catching it and drawing it back. So when you think about what's happening there, that's actually quite hard and a frog's tongue must have some pretty special properties. So the researchers behind this um, um, project investigated frog tongues to find out, well, what is it about frog tongues that let them essentially catch an insect in less than 0.1 of a second, five times faster than you can blink, and bring it back. So... Because that's the thing, it, it, yeah. it, it sticks its tongue out so fast and it so hits fast. this insect with the acceleration of 12 times that of gravity and yet it doesn't knock the fly away, it actually is yeah, still it able to grab away. onto it. Yeah, it doesn't it sticks and it takes it in. That's so pretty they, um, they collected frog tongues from dissection class and there's something, I don't know, very touchingly pathetic about the thought of all those little frog tongues <laughs> um, to study them as a material and they found that... They were very, very sticky. They were also very, very, very soft and not stiff. So essentially when um, they hit a target, instead of being um, stiff and batting it away, the, because it's so soft, it kind of, its inertia lets it sort of wrap around the target and increase the surface area that's contacting with the little insect. The other thing that is interesting about frog tongues is their saliva, which is really, really viscous. So I can't imagine doing this, but scraping, they spend a lot of time scraping saliva from frog tongues. So when they scraped, apparently it was so viscous that they would then have to scrape it off the scraper <laughs> and it took half an hour to get half a milliliter of frog saliva. And frog saliva is actually a non-Newtonian fluid, and that means it changes its behaviour depending on the forces applied. You might have made a really simple one in Year 7 science of um, corn flour and water, mm -hmm. mix it up, and if you pour it slowly, it will dribble down like a liquid. 
If you punch it, put it in a big, make a big lot of it, put it in an ice cream tub and give it a punch, it will shatter. So it's called a, a shear thickening fluid. So, so um, a different kind of fluid is a shear thinning fluid, which becomes runnier if shaken. So for example, tomato sauce or toothpaste. Toothpaste just sits there like a blob, but if you squeeze it, it will become a bit runnier. Same with tomato sauce. I think we've all shaken the bottle to get mm-hmm. sauce to flow. So frog saliva is like that. It becomes less viscous when it moves. So human saliva, as a reference point, it becomes about 10 times less viscous when you apply force to it. Frog saliva, saliva becomes 100 times less viscous. So that's a pretty big change Huge. in properties. So when the tongue hits the insect, not only does it expand out, or not expand, but you know what I mean, it, it's because it's so soft it wraps around, but the saliva can just freely go and engulf every bit of the insect and grab it. And then when the tongue slows down, so it's not moving so fast, the saliva becomes more viscous and essentially thickens around the insect, which cannot escape and it gets onto it for its journey back. This is also why frogs, when they swallow, they um, always shut their eyes, and this is because their eyeballs actually help push their prey down their throats. Wait, so what? their eyeballs. Hang on. What? Oh, did you guys not know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something because I've always laughed at it because uh, my child does this too. <laughs> What? <laughs> Humans don't do it, by the way. He just shuts his eyes when he swallows. <laughs> I think he looks like some frog. But um, <laughs> it's not easy being a biologist and a, t- a parent. <laughs> how how yeah, does yeah. it use its eye? What? I don't get yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So they use their eyeballs. So when they swallow, they shut their eyes, their eyeballs move down and helps slide the insects off their tongues and pushing it down the throat. And right. this has been shown by um, x-ray videos. So it sort of pushes on the, the roof of the mouth sort of thing and helps slide it off mm. the tongue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah, oh, not, not, like, not like the eyeballs in the throat. Yeah, like yeah it doesn't pull them out and then go uh, down its throat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is oh, not like some starfish weird. kind of situation where the stomach goes external. Yeah, yeah. So frog tongues, eyeballs, saliva. And I guess as always, I mean, (laughs) when you think about these quite astonishing materials and properties, I mean, who knows, again, as always, this kind of research that seems to be really pointless, like you want a grant to study frog tongues, who knows what kind of materials might be developed or, um, you know, created from this understanding of this kind of really different behaving fluids or you know, yeah. the softness of the frog tongue, etc. So I think an interesting story, and I've always quite liked frogs. So, <laughs> But, I mean, as you say, the, the possibilities of this are really quite incredible when you think about making some a, a glue or an adhesive of, of some sort yeah, yeah, yeah. that powerful and that strong or making materials that soft and stretchy, you know, we can learn so much from biomimicry uh, that it's mm-hmm. really cool. Uh, well, Lucas, do you want to tell us all about the new type of black hole that astronomers have discovered? I, this is pretty impressive to me, I think. Yeah, so it's been theorised for quite some time that there's a, a class of black holes that's um, known as the intermediate mass black hole. So just, you know, in, in terms of where this fits in the family tree, you've got your, your stellar mass black holes, so that's basically... Um, thought to be caused by a, a star, you know, that's around maybe five to you know tens of times of the of the mass of our sun. So you know, five to you know twenty or thirty times the mass of our sun. Um, and they they you know they're too big to collapse into a, a, a white dwarf or or whatever. So they tend to collapse down, you know, just due to the immense forces of gravity pushing down on the on their core. They collapse down into a black hole. So these these are the ones that are probably just, you know, <laughs> just moving around through our galaxy, and uh, we we often don't know they're there until they interact with something, because you know 
being black and all that, uh, not being, you know, the light can't can't get through, get, can't get away from them. So um, then we've got, of course, you would have heard of the supermassive black holes, and these are the ones that are thought to, you know, be in the core of most galaxies. Um, it's quite possible they're in the you know core of, of all galaxies, and maybe they're the the um, one of the seeds of galaxies, maybe the you know part of how galaxies form. And again, you know, we've we've got a lot of evidence that these exist mainly, th- you know, through the uh, gravitational interactions that they have with the stars in towards the centers of galaxies. Um, they also tend to uh, make themselves known when they start eating. Uh, when they do that, they, they can often then um, eject these these really you know incredible jets of, of, uh, uh, of, of material and, and various x-rays and so forth. Um, uh, these these massive um, uh, jets that go out from the, from the poles, and uh, yeah, they basically make themselves known that way. And uh, m- you know, mainly in the infrared, we can see them quite clearly, and and in the X-ray because they just um, you know things that are, are nearby, if they start eating, will will just superheat as as they uh, basically uh, um, queue up around the event horizon. So we've known about these for quite some time, and you know they've all been theorised, but also theorised are these intermediate mass black holes, and these ones are the the extraordinarily large um, uh, stars um, and and maybe groups of stars, maybe mergers of, of, of those types of stellar mass black holes. Um, the thing is with these, and they, these are sort of somewhere in the mass of the range of maybe 100 to, to a million or so solar masses, um, so not quite large enough to be a supermassive black hole, which is kind of bizarre when you're talking about a million <laughs> not being enough to be a supermassive black hole but the supermassive black holes are in the range of sort of like you know millions to to hundreds of millions to billions of solar masses which is just staggering to, okay, to my to brain's think exploded about. now <laughs> i know you can't you can't really deal with that it's just uh it's just too much and we don't really know you know there's 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 no <laughs> there's a lot of theories as to how they um how they would form but it's it's really hard to get your brain around that sort of you know that sort of mass so these other intermediate mass black holes, although they've been theorised for quite some time, we we've, we haven't really have we haven't really found strong evidence for these in the, in the past. And there's been a few you know um, uh, candidates that have been that have been spotted in in the past, but uh, uh, they they really you know it's it's been really hard to nail them down. So, fast forward to, um, uh, what was it, about a week or so ago that the announcement was made? When was it? 9th of Feb. So, yeah, only only a few days ago was this story. Um, and some new observational evidence uh, is, is indicating that um, uh, there's a, a new... Uh, this new new class of black hole is is actually uh, a real thing, which is which is really really cool. Um, there's a new intermediate mass black hole spotted, uh, which is hiding at the centre of a globular cluster known as the S47 Tucane. I might be uh, uh, Tucane or something I like that. I say Tucane, but I don't know what the I say Tucane. <laughs> oh, say no, tucane. Was... <laughs> but it's an um, awesome globular cluster. It's pretty easy to find as well because it's sort of in the middle of nowhere uh, in the sky. And it is just huge, massive. I just stars. love the fact that there is a a, a constellation called Tucane, Tucana, <laughs> the Toucan. There's a freaking Toucan constellation. <laughs> How did I not know this? That is so cool. Um, toucans are cool. Just they are. This clear is true. On that. Um, so this this uh, this cluster, this globular cluster, is uh, basically globular clusters are, are kind of like you know tiny little galaxies. And when I say mm. tiny, they they contain you know th- in the order of thousands of stars. Um, so um, you know there, there are quite a stars, few. Yeah. Say again. They're like balls of stars, just big super globes. Yeah, yeah. They and and they're they're just they're beautiful beautiful things. And there's there's a whole lot of globular clusters that you can actually see through telescopes. And it's it's one of my favourite things to do is is to actually point a telescope or um or even binoculars if you've got some pretty decent binoculars, particularly if you've got image stabilised binoculars, point them at a dark area of the sky. And it's just amazing how much you can actually see. How many how many things there's there's really very little in the sky that's dark. And that was uh, of course, the um, the story behind the uh, the NASA sorry the Hubble Deep Field that was a you know section of sky that they chose precisely because it it, it was so dark and they thought well let's point you know Hubble at at, at uh, a really dark part of the sky that as far as we know there's nothing there let's have a look and and look for a long time and see if there's anything there and what do 
you know, there's a lot of stuff there, and that's just you know one of the most iconic, you know, images that um, that that, that uh, people tend to have on posters on their walls and stuff like that. So very very cool. So anyway, um, so they've basically they've uh, they've had a look at this particular globular cluster, and normally so normally they spot black holes as i mentioned before by looking for x-rays so yeah, x-rays are um uh, the the uh the the wavelength of light that that reaches us that's uh that's that's generated by all of this stuff that's that's forming around the um the black hole the accretion disk basically is all this stuff that's all getting super super heated through 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 lining up trying to get into the um into the event horizon. So the the problem with that is that you can only do that when a black hole is feeding. So mm. um, if it's not feeding, it really doesn't give off much presence at all. And 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 it could well be that in the future we can use things like potentially, you know, Hawking radiation to to um, identify things, which is where black holes effectively just evaporate. They're all they they basically are always giving off this energy, but it's um it's a it's a, an infinitesimally small amount of energy, and and we don't really have a way of detecting that, um you know reliably. So it's um. It means that at the moment we can we only tend to see black holes when either they are feeding or when there are things moving around them that we can only explain by saying, okay, there must be something there because stars are doing some really crazy weird stuff. Um, and you can see, you know, these interactions where stars get slingshotted around and and um, you know interact with something that's clearly very massive, um, you know, in the orbit that they're going around and around and around. Hmm. Um, so. That's pretty much how they spotted um, this one in the globular cluster. Um, what they were basically doing was they were they were monitoring the the motion of stars in this cluster, and uh, they weren't just looking as they as they have done with things like finding the the black hole, the supermassive black hole in the centre of the Milky Way, um, where they were looking at individual stars to see what their motion was. In this case, they were looking at the entire globular cluster to try and get a, a feeling for what was going on. And only once they had a look at the entire globular cluster, which they could do because globular clusters are kind of like scaled down uh, galaxies in many ways, but they you know they don't cover the same amount of sky. Um, they what they found was that there was there was definitely something that was causing stars to slingshot around within the globular cluster. And again, uh -huh. this is kind of this is all there's really only one good explanation for this this is this is a lot of mass that's causing things to um, you know to go crazy so then they had another look at this this area and they looked at pulsars and pulsars which which are which are also you know dead stars they're basically a, a class of dead star that's um, uh, one when, when these things collapse down they they spin very 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 fast and they give off um, uh, basically beams of radiation which if you can imagine like a lighthouse um, mm. you know spinning around and around and around these things are incredibly fast there are there are pulsars for example that are in the um, you know millisecond range which means that they're spinning you know thousands of times per second and what that is 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 um, the result of the of a conservation of angular momentum. When these things have, have collapsed down, they, they had really, really big stars and they had a certain spin. But when they've collapsed down, the spin is maintained, but you've now got a much smaller object that's, that's carrying all that energy. So grossly oversimplified, but that's basically what, you know, what causes these pulsars to spin so incredibly fast. So they're really cool objects, but, um, but the good thing about pulsars is you can infer a lot from them based on their uh, by how much they're pulsing so they basically their spin rate gives you an idea of how big they must have been and this sort of thing and you can track anyway. them because they're that's like an individual signature is that spin that's right rate. So yes you can see it exactly. move throughout a cluster yes so anyway so they found not only were there groups of stars and and kind of if you imagine you know stirring a pot for example if you had like a a big you know crock pot you know boiling with a um you know a nice big stew in it and you were stirring that around the way that you stir it around you kind of cause this this overall soup to move around you know in the mm -hmm. in the direction of, of your stir the individual things aren't moving all that much but you kind of you get the medium sort of moving around in this this shape that's what they originally sort of saw in the globular cluster it was sort of a general feeling of movement and then they nailed it down even further by finding some pulsars within this globular cluster that were also being slung you know slingshot around and because they're pulsars they could track them just as you said they had this unique signature so that um and together with the the overall 
um, you know, size of the globular cluster, it basically ended up with a calculation of around, you know, sort of two 2,200-ish two solar masses of, of a black hole. Now, that is smack bang, you know, in that, in that region of this uh, intermediate mass black hole. So... That's really cool. Um, you know, there's quite a large margin of error on it. So, you know, it could be anywhere up to just under 4,000 solar masses, maybe down to about, you know, 11, 13, 1,400 solar masses, something like that. But even so, this is not a stellar mass black hole. It is not a supermassive black hole. It's, it's, it's in that middle ground, which is really cool. Um, and it's, yeah. it's one of those things that, you know, there's so many things that have been theorized. And then it just, you know, it takes, it takes a, um, an observational uh, scientist to come along and actually collect evidence of these things exactly. and, and tell us whether or not we, yeah. we see them in, in reality. And yeah, that's uh, it caught my eye for that reason because it's, uh, you know, that incremental, incremental, which I always talk about, that incremental <laughs> journey towards uh, filling in the blanks. And so now we have three categories of black holes. We've got stellar black holes with a little bit more mass than our sun, supermassive mm -hmm. black holes with millions of billions of suns, and now intermediate mass black holes. And I don't know if that's going to be an official term or anything, but... Uh, yeah, well, it, it has, as I say, the, the term's been around for quite some time because they've okay. long been thought to exist. They just hadn't found a great deal of observational evidence. There were hints of these things in the past, yeah. um, but uh, but this is the first really strong evidence for it. And, it. and as I say, it's really hard to explain it in other ways. And we don't have to invoke <laughs> aliens or any of this stuff either. But is, it, could, it could be aliens. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I thought, you know, might get a bit more media attention that way. <laughs> no, it could be, but probably. I'll answer that. I'll answer attention. that question for our Patreon. Uh, ah. uh, <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Uh, Scienceontop.com slash donate. Uh, <laughs> all right, Penny. Let's. Um, bring it to turn down to something more human now and babies and making them happy. Uh, this is research. Well, this is a, a song that's actually been made to make them happy because all, all of the music for babies tends to be how to sort of slow them down, quiet them and make them bloody well go to sleep. But this is actually about making them laugh, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, obviously I think I was joking with Ed before the show. It's good to cover the really hard hitting kind of stories, but I, I did like it. Um, it's been long known that babies are quite, they, they remember music, they sense it in different music effects and differently. And by measuring, you know, their studies, they, people, their, um, you know, heartbeat and brain responses and so on, people can tell that, you know, babies have music preferences. And I think most people who've been around kids know that kids taste in music is often quite different to adults' taste <laughs> in music. And this becomes even more obvious when they become teenagers. <laughs> it's very clear that their taste is not only different, it's wrong. Sorry, please go on. <laughs> I, I don't know about that. I don't know. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Toot Toot Chugga Chugga Big Red Car lately, so... And I mean a lot. Well, please tell me that's uh, because of your own family situation. That's not the teenagers yeah. at the school. Okay, good. No, no, no. That is my own family situation. The teenagers at the school. Look, I don't know what they're up to lately because I'm in the primary school. But <laughs> okay. yeah, actually, I take your point. One Direction. <laughs> that's not what I was thinking. But yeah, yeah. But I digress. Um, there's a lot. Of, has I think a lot of effort has been poured into trying to as Lucas said, get babies to sleep. Um, anything from lullabies, beautiful lullabies, to the sound of a hairdryer on full right in their ear seems to be quite effective for that. Oh, vacuum but cleaners. Makes, yeah, vacuum, vacuum yeah, vacuuming with them strapped to you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. going back a long way now, but yeah. It's a whole nother world to me. Anyway. <laughs> Some people put them in their, like in a bassinet thing on top of a, a dryer, a clothes dryer, a dryer when it's going. <laughs> Okay. Well, we actually had a CD of like creepy heartbeat <laughs> womb swishing. <laughs> hop, 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 hop. <laughs> Just yeah, if you want to go a little trip, look down white noise for babies on YouTube, and there's some crazy stuff. But yeah, anyway, this is a a baby, a happy baby song project. Um, and look, I don't think it was done ultra scientifically. I think it it seems like it was um you know a bit of fun but what kind of song what do babies like 
what makes them feel happy. Um, they like quite upbeat music. Their, um, their heartbeats are pretty quick. They like female voices. They like it even more when you Come talk on. like this. Yes, they do. Oh, yes, no. they do. Yeah, yeah. stop that it. Kind of stop it, please. Okay. <laughs> Which uh, I think most okay. of us We have just lost every Patreon subscriber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but maybe we've just got a whole new niche of them. Who knows? Yeah, they, they can't know, afford yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, they got a musician who has an 18-month-old daughter, who, to try and write a few different songs. She wrote a few different songs. Um, they tested them out with some focus groups of babies. They also got parents to learn a song or to play the song and record their video their babies and they coded the video responses to see which ones laugh more and smile more and so on. So I don't know if Ed can play a little clip of the song. Yeah, shall we have a listen to it now? Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, let's play a little bit. It's um, reasonably repetitive. <laughs> ring, ring on the bicycle, beep, beep in the car, ping, ping, a submarine, phew, phew, helicopter, wow. a choo-choo train, an aeroplane, a wee down the slide. I just adore, 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 you every day. Anyway, like I can imagine listening to that on repeat on a two-hour car journey just with no other tracks. Sounds can you? <laughs> I can. Oh, dear. Uh, and this is why I never go on road trips with you, Penny. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. I will say that's, that's a, probably one of the better songs for babies that I've heard. Not that I've heard very many, but that's less kind of get-under-the-skin annoying ones. I will say that. It's all right, like, yeah. <laughs> um, but what I found interesting was the features that were um, really important in this. And it's interesting when I think about, my, the, you know, the songs that my kids respond to. And it was really social. So there was funny sounds like boo, raspberries, sneezing, laughing. Mm. Apparently babies respond better to the plosive vocal sounds, stuff like pa and ba rather than la. And it was something about sharing. So it was all about action and, you know, going on different kinds of transport and how we love our babies and how we're together and so on. So I thought that was really quite cute. And it's kind of interesting because I have no doubt that behind One Direction and Taylor Swift and everyone else that we were discussing is are teams of psychologists and marketers um, figuring out what we like in music. Mm. and not even what we like, but what will just get us to click again and listen again. Um, So to think about how babies are a little bit different is quite interesting to me, especially because, oh, their music can be so, so inane, so very inane. Anyway... (laughs) I'm just really sad that Shane couldn't join us for this show because I think he would would love to be talking about baby music. (laughs) And he would have really liked to hear me talk in that mothery voice. No. Anyway. Uh, (laughs) All right. Well, Lucas, uh, there is a bridge of stars connecting two of our closest galaxies. Uh, this is pretty cool. Like a bridge of stars, is that so one galaxy is kind of sucking stars away from the other or something like that? Yeah, um, you've probably seen um, animations in the past of, of um, gravitational interactions between merging galaxies. There's, there's certainly been, I've seen over the years, a lot of um, a lot of animations of, uh, depicting what it's likely to be like when Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way merge. Um, sometime in the future, which will happen. Um, so when you know when galaxies merge, basically they end up with this kind of 
you know, weird spiral dance for a while as they, as, as the gravity of each of them uh, interacts and pulls on the edges of the, of the galaxies. I'm making hand motions right now that you can't see. Um, but uh, you, you end up with these very elaborate sort of patterns and eventually they, they settle down, you know, often we think into pro- probably elliptical galaxies once they've, they've lost, you know, depending on the, on the, on the angle of the, of, of disks, if they're, if they start off as, um, as spiral galaxies, for example, they, they, lose that kind of that beautiful disc formation and, and uh, we think probably become ellipticals but um you know when when this does happen or when even galaxies just pass nearby um you know it is uh, it, it's expected that their gravity will will interact and it will disturb you know parts of, of those clouds so if you look in the sky on any given night, if you're lucky enough to live in an area that you, you have you know, not too much light pollution, you may see two fuzzy patches um, of, of, um, uh, of light in the sky, which are uh, sort of next to, uh, depending on which hemisphere you're in, next to, or mainly you can see them from the southern hemisphere, so sorry, northern folks. <laughs> um, um, you can see them next to the Milky Way, and they're not too far apart from each other. Sort of, you know, I think you know, I'm just visualising my 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 mind now. Probably about you know a hand's width apart, something like that, from memory. If you look at them in the sky, and you know, they're they're quite uh, interesting. Um, they're they're known as the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. So these are small galaxies, they're dwarf galaxies that, uh, that are basically thought to be within the same you know, local group that we're in um, and are you know, locked in a, in a similar orbit to the, to the Milky Way. Um, it's thought that they probably passed closer to the Milky Way at some point in time. Um, but up until now, we haven't really seen a great deal of evidence of interaction between the two. They're not overly close together. So, I mean, they're close together as, as you know, looking at them in the sky. But, uh, but in terms of their actual distance apart, they're, uh, they're not sort of right next door to each other. What's changed recently is the, there's a mission called the Gaia spacecraft. And Gaia is basically... Um, it's 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 got a long term mission to uh, to chart mapped and motions of, of of nearby stars basically. So it has uh, a fairly unique perspective on the sky because it looks um, at at a very large percentage of the sky because it is it is mainly concerned about you know mapping the notions of uh, motions of stars. So because it's looking at such a big large you know uh, a swathe of the sky, it can actually um, uh, it can see large structures like the Magellanic Clouds and track movements between those. But what it can also do is it can detect stars between those two galaxies. And there is a particular type of star, which we've discussed on the show, I think, you know, a couple of times before, which are the RR Lyria stars. Mm-hmm. And these are variable stars. So... They're kind of important for for several reasons because they're they're part of the um, the way that we in the, uh, have have you know come up with measuring distances in in the galaxy. So they're they're quite important from that perspective because variable stars can be you know like we talked about before with the pulsars they they have a particular um, signature which allows you to work out um, things like their mass and, and luminosity. And once you know luminosity of a, of an object, you can what what you would expect it to be, then you can work out how far away it is so you know we're, we're very interested in these stars typically anyway just for working out distances so it's these stars which have been around for a really really long time um, billions of years these stars have been around for like you know think sort of 10 billion years or so um, if you uh, they've detected these stars with Gaia and there's basically yeah a bridge like a if you imagine just a trail of stars uh, in between the large and small Magellanic clouds it does look like that at some point when they've passed close closer to each other the LMC is basically stripping stars away from the uh, the, the, the small cloud which is really really cool we haven't seen this before mm. Um the other thing that's interesting is there's also indications that um, that the Milky Way is pulling some stars from the large cloud as well, from the LMC, and we didn't know this either. So that's also really really cool, seeing these these filaments that are that are basically joining, you know, these 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 um, 
uh, small galaxies with our own. It's uh, it's really really awesome. Mm-hmm. So you know what comes next? Well, you know probably more observations with other instruments. It, it's not you know nothing overly um, you know mind blowing at the moment in terms of uh, our understanding of the universe. But uh, it is pretty cool to see these interactions that we that we hadn't detected before. Yeah, definitely. So the Magellanic clouds do they they orbit each other? And the Milky Way, or just the Milky um, Way individually, it, or we don't know. It is actually, it's actually really hard to know um, mm. because because they're relatively far away. Like when I say relatively, they're they're you know they're obviously not inside the Milky Way. So you know everything more or less inside the Milky Way is closer to us. Um, um, what that means is their relative motion in the sky is tiny, yeah. very very small relative motion. So it's actually really hard to figure out where they're going in what direction they're going and at what you know velocity they're moving um, you have to use other other means such as getting inferences from individual stars within them to then start thinking about redshift blue shift that sort of thing mm. so so at the moment we you know uh, as far as I can tell we don't really know a great deal um, about where they're going we just know that they appear to be locked in a similar um, 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 direction and orbit as 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 we are and as Andromeda is and there's basically there's this this whole area that's on the annoyingly on the other side of the Milky Way so we can't see it directly which which they call the Great Attractor um, and and uh, it, it it appears that everything within within this 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 massive group of galaxies which we call our local group appears to be you know being pulled towards that. We just can't see it because mm. <laughs> we're blocked by all the light of the Milky Way. So, um, so yeah. Beyond that, you know, it's 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 not very easy to tell. Uh, mm. Certainly, within the span of a human lifetime, you you wouldn't really see any any relative motion. So, you know, on the against the the Milky Way. So, yeah, it's quite difficult. I just find it fascinating that you know these are compared to say the uh, Andromeda galaxy which is our nearest major galaxy these are actually fairly close to us but they're still they're so yeah. small and so distant that mm. it makes it really hard to to know much but that's really cool this this stream of stars between the two everything interacts with everything else in space it's really awesome that is it i mean that's that's it's kind of it's a little bit poetic to think about it because even on 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 um, you know with structures that large and distances that great there's still a relationship between things. And yeah. I kind of, I think, you know, I don't want to get all misty-eyed, but that kind of just, it really kind of uh, illustrates a point that, you know, on a smaller scale, we're, we're all connected. So, yeah, kind of cool. Everything is connected. And I think that's a good note to finish up on. If you want any more information about the stories we talked about, if you want to get in touch with us, just head to scienceontop.com slash 254. You'll find our social media information there too, and you can leave a comment. And, of course, don't forget to check out scienceontop.com slash donate if you want to throw some coin our way and help us out. Thanks for joining us today, Penny and Lucas. Thank you. You're welcome. This episode was edited with fervour and expertise by Marcos Benamou. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. Where do people live in the world? I divided the world in four parts, and we are indeed seven billion. One billion in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. Remember, pin code of the world, 1114. <laughs> it will change. 2050, no more people in Europe, no more in America, one billion more in Asia, and by that, the fast population growth is over in Asia. And there will be one billion more in Africa. Africa will double its population in the next 35 years. And up to the end of the century, no more in America, Europe, and Asia, but there will be one or two billion more in Africa. And by that, no, it's good. People with two arms and a good brain, they'll work hard. And I have an advice to Americans and to Europeans. Start being polite to Africans already today. Because they are going to outnumber you. And whether you are going to have them as enemies or friends, just start being polite as of today.